hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another Syria security seminar. My name is Haris Katsis and I will be moderating the today's talk. Today it's, it is our privilege to have David, uh, David Haddad. So a few words about our speaker. David is an assistant director in Ernst & Young's America's technology uh, risk management practice. He focuses on America's and global technology risk assessments, supports IT and data regulatory efforts, and coordinates IT risk management process for the member firms. He brings over eight years of external and internal experience in information security, consulting, technology, IT audit, and GRC across public and private industries. He previously served as uh, an adjunct instructor and lecturer for the undergraduate programs at Purdue University Northwest. David, thank you, and the floor is yours. Screen. Great. All right. So welcome, everyone. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here today with you all. Um, my name is David Haddad. I'm Assistant Director of Technology Risk Management at Ernst & Young. I'm an also a fourth year doctoral student here at Purdue University. Um, today's discussion is going to revolve around the rapidly changing risk landscape of artificial intelligence. Um, we're going to be navigating through what I like to call the AI security maze, right? The top cybersecurity risks, um, what are some strategic planning efforts that organizations can take that will lead into resilient operations. So for today's agenda, I'll give a brief introduction about myself and my professional and academic experiences. Uh, we'll discuss the cybersecurity risk landscape from an AI perspective, um, discuss some of the regulatory challenges and, and compliance challenges that organizations face today and in the future, and discuss a few brief strategic initiatives for AI adoption and risk mitigation. And then we'll close off the session with a Q&A session. So uh, a little bit about myself, brief introduction. Um, I bring over eight years of experience across various industries, public and private institutions. Um, started my career at the Chicago Transit Authority. So if you've ever been the in the Chicago Loop and you've rode the buses or trains, that's where I began my career. Um, then transitioned to the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Um, and today I'm currently at Ernst & Young. Um, in terms of my academic and education experience, um, I did my undergrad at Purdue University Northwest, master's at Purdue University Northwest, and again, the doctoral program here at Purdue West Lafayette. So if you're asking if I bleed black and gold, the question is, the answer is yes. Um, and then a few of my research interests, so it really revolves around AI and risk management. Um, that can be across AI GRC, security control frameworks, um, data protection and privacy, et cetera. So before we get into the presentation, I want all of you to take a minute to reflect because not only is AI uh, rapidly evolving the way we live, it's also introducing a lot of risks. And, you know, AI means something different to all of us. So I want everyone to just take a minute, reflect, and answer the question of what does AI mean to you? And then I'll ask a few people to share what it means to them. Any volunteers? Well, I can, I can go first, I suppose. So for me, I, AI would be uh, basically the integration of intelligence with, uh, with the machine, the way that the machine can process nat maybe natural intelligence and use it either to generate like simple outputs or even natural language text, it really depends what the task is. That's great, yeah. Yeah, for me, I mean, it's just like intelligent assistance for me. I mean, it's taking all the little things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis or just stuff like, for example, like iPhones, Siri, which is awful, <laughs> and making it what we all wish it was, like making it look a lot better, but 
also being intelligent and being able to understand what you want and not making a more uh, a better human to human interaction versus just you know you're talking to a robot. Absolutely. I think the room is small enough, so if we can do a go around <laughs> <laughs> or anyone in the chat as well. So for me, I think it's it's about um, productivity acceleration. Absolutely. Yeah, for me too. It's just uh, instead of the to cut down the barrier between you're not talking to a computer, but to like closer to a human, I guess. All great perspectives, and again, AI means something different to all of us. All right, welcome. So now we'll briefly talk about the strategy and solutions alignment. So as I previously mentioned, the rapid digital era that we live in today, digital transformations, they continue to rapidly evolve the way that we live, the way that we interact with technology, the way that we interact amongst one another. And so we've noticed that AI is impacting industries and sectors from a very diverse perspective, whether it be technology or energy and industrial or healthcare and sciences. But organizations have to keep a critical factor in mind and that's AI adoption, right? So when we discuss with clients or we're getting a better understanding of how will you utilize AI, there's an underlying theme here and that's value, right? Organizations need to adopt technology that will provide value to their strategic initiatives and their objectives. And so a typical question that we like to pose is, how can technology practitioners develop AI solutions aligning with client strategic goals and ob objectives? But there's something fundamentally missing from this question. And that is security. So security is top of mind. Security cannot be an additional layer. It's a functional requirement that needs to be baked in from the beginning as part of DevSecOps. And so a better question to ask is, how can technology practitioners develop secure and resilient solutions aligning with client strategic goals and objectives? We need to make sure it's secure and resilient. So I want to briefly touch on a few AI components and emerging tech opportunities. Figure one outlines the underlying components of AI, right? We're all pretty familiar with this, but I want to pay your, I want to direct your attention to the right side of gen AI um, around LLMs, NLP, and GPTs. This is really where the industry has a lot of appetite for, right? Organizations want to implement their own chatbots, um, their own gen AI solutions, whether it be for internal use or to use externally um, for their service offerings. So that's really the direction we're at today in the industry is organizations want to adopt gen AI solutions for either their internal uses or to help them with productivity for their service offerings. And so figure two, I, I would like to outline is around uh, Gartner's hype cycle for emerging technologies. And why is this important? Well, on an annual basis, Gartner um, publishes these hype cycles around emerging technologies. And if you pay your attention to the bottom axis, these are the five phase, life cycle phases that technology typically goes through. If we look at the first quadrant of the innovation trigger, we notice something very important that all of us are studying today or have ex experience in, and that's cybersecurity. So cybersecurity solutions are categorized in the innovation trigger. What does that mean? That means that two years and under, there's going to be a potential breakthrough with cybersecurity solutions powered by AI. Of course, there are others, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to focus on cybersecurity solutions. 
So as you all continue your studies and your education and your work, keep that in mind because this is an area where a lot of innovation is going to take place. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities to break into cyber AI solutions. So let's discuss a little bit about the AI cyber risk landscape. As we all know, AI is continuing to rapidly transform the technology landscape. From a traditional attack vector perspective, not only is it increasing, but it's also expanding the impact, right? Traditional uh, attack vectors that we're typically used to within cybersecurity, it's being uh, rapidly increased and they're becoming more sophisticated. Um, simultaneously, emerging attack vectors are coming about. So AI attack vectors and TTPs, they continue to be a black box. There are so many unknowns at the moment with what is AI capable of doing in terms of a cybersecurity perspective. So it's really critical that we keep that in mind when we're developing remediation, preventative detective control solutions to mitigate these threats. And so on the right hand side here, we have a few um, top AI cyber risks. And we'll get into these on the next slide um, more in depth. But if you look at the quadrant, the right side, the first three circles, and some would argue the fourth, typically deal with technical risks, right? While you're developing these AI solutions. Um, and then on the left-hand side is more of the GRC, the governance, the regulatory requirements, uh, the emerging um, the emerging uh, compliance requirements that we're seeing in industry today. And so I want to spend a few moments just talking about the top Gen AI cyber risks. First one is model poisoning. And when you refer to this slide, um, what I did was provide a high level overview in black bold and in gold lettering beneath um, in the spirit of Purdue Boilermakers. Um, we have a few generic examples of how, how these can be um, executed. So the first one, model poisoning. Attackers manipulate these model parameters to induce undesirable behavior in the model. So that's really modifying the model. And so uh, malicious uh, actors may compromise a malware detection model to ignore specific types of parameters, malware, and TTPs. Data poisoning. So this is a key critical risk. And what this deals with is the malicious or inaccurate data being injected into training data sets, leading to flawed model performance. So data sets typically start with human in the loop. They typically start with software developers creating these data sets and these learning modules. And an additional consideration is biases, right? Everyone has their own internal biases, but what if those biases are transferred into training the data or developing the model? How would that skew our results? It may skew it significantly, and it may produce undesirable results. And so an example would be injecting false network traffic data into an intrusion prevention system, resulting in false negatives or positives. Next, we have input manipulation. And this really deals with the malicious modification of training data to mislead models, causing it to produce incorrect or faulty results. So right on par, very similar with the data poisoning example. And so you may experience altering input data um, in a phishing detection model. And that would lead it to misclassify phishing emails as legitimate or we have social engineering right on par with um, the phishing example. So this really deals with using Gen AI to exploit human psychology so that we can deceive users into giving up sensitive information or gaining unauthorized access to systems um, which can compromise these AI models. And so I know we've heard this example um, in industry a lot, deep fakes. It's becoming more and more popular. And so this deals, uh, an example would be 
creating a deep fake to impersonate a CISO or an executive in an organization to release funds. Acceptable use. So acceptable use really is um, a policy, typically in organizations where we outline which technologies, which processes are acceptable to use, whether that be internally or for client work externally. And so when we think of data collection and how much data we collect, it's a lot. It's an abundant, right? It's an abundance. So acceptable use, when we look at, for an example, a statement of work, which typically outlines the services that we'll provide for a client or will do for somebody, the statement of work has to clearly identify the scope of work. And so what you'll see in AI is if we collect data, let's say from um, a client, do we, have the you, do we have the right to use that data to train our internal AI models? Possibly, depending on the statement of work, or maybe not at all. Maybe that was not outlined in the statement of work. So we have to be very cautious in what are we using the data we collect for, and we have to limit it into the scope and into our means. And lastly, compliance. So as we know, compliance, especially in AI, is pretty light at the moment. There are a few um, countries in which I'll review in later slides that are either in progress or they have distributed AI regulations. Um, and so achieving compliance is very difficult and it's expensive for organizations. But what's even more expensive is non-compliance. And so organizations really take this seriously and they're ahead of the curve of understanding what are the reg regulatory requirements that are in place today and what are the emerging regulatory requirements pertaining to AI. So I wanna briefly go over regulatory landscape and compliance challenges. So, AI is continuously increasing the volume and complexities of achieving regulatory compliance. Why is that? And that's through something I like to call risks. And this is not your typical risk that you think of. This is regulatory intensity and scope complexities. So as I mentioned previously, AI is, especially from an attack vector perspective, it's really a black box, right? There are so many unknowns with that. And so regulatory compliance is pretty similar. Um, we don't know exactly, we have a good idea, but we don't know, you know, how would the regulatory landscape change over time through the use of AI? What if AI solutions and products are embedded in most technologies going forward? What oversight do we need for that? Um, so these scope complexities are expected to become more and more complex and stringent and at the height of executive leadership's awareness. And so there are some key global AI law and policies um, that have been distributed or are forthcoming. Um, the first one is within the EU called the EU AI Act. Um, and so compliance to certain sections of this act is going to be required as early as I believe February of 2025, so Q1 of 2025. So organizations who um, adhere to GDPR and they have AI prohibited systems or general purpose AI systems will need to achieve regulatory compliance to the EU AI Act. Um, from the United States perspective, we do have executive orders and acts and bills, but we don't have any federally mandated laws in place related to AI. Um, that is going to be coming down the pipeline soon. I, th I, I believe that's going to be the trend, um, but for now we do have just executive orders, acts and bills. And lastly, other countries are also uh, taking charge on AI compliance from a regulatory standpoint. And here are a list of the countries that either have laws enacted in place 
or they may have executive orders or proposed acts and bills. And so the list will obviously continue to grow and grow as organizations and as countries mature their AI operations and adoption. So strategic initiatives for AI adoption and risk mitigation. Well, we talked about value early on, and that's really the core. That's the foundation for organizations adopting AI, whether it be part of their gen AI solution adoptions or uh, they're using very advanced, let's say, cyber security tools that incorporate uh, AI in the back end. And so the first step is strategic coordination and business alignment. It's critical to align your organization's current objectives and goals to AI adoption. And you want to do this cross-functionally, right? It shouldn't just be cybersecurity or it shouldn't just be technology departments doing this. It needs to be holistic. It needs to include um, procurement, legal, data protection, privacy, cybersecurity. So it's important to have representation across the board. But also, more importantly, is you want to be sure that you're able to measure value. And what I mean by that is, if you adopt AI as part of your business as usual normal operations, what value would it provide to you and your organization? What value would it provide to your clients? And so you ask yourself the question of, why would I adopt something that will not provide value to me? And so organizations need to have that same mindset in terms of AI adoption. Secondly, enterprise maturity assessment and readiness. So let's say an organization says, I'm on board to adopt AI um, as part of a service offering or I want to implement it as part of my um, cyber activities. What's the plan going forward for that? Are we going to buy or build? How mature is our organization to do that? Should we develop AI solutions in-house or should we procure them from third party and vendors? And so that's what that really gets about is assessing your resource availability. If you're a small organization and you, know, you don't have the resources to develop AI solutions, you're probably going to source that out from a third party versus you know, a very prominent technology company who has the resource availabilities. They'll most likely develop those AI solutions in-house and eventually offer them uh, for clients um, to purchase. And the last um, area of focus is really governance. So we went through the first two stages of aligning strategic goals and objectives, assessing the maturity of the organization, but it doesn't stop there. Early on, similar to DevSecOps processes, we need to include AI governance, risk, and controls oversight. And what I mean by this is, we need to develop and enforce robust AI governance frameworks that integrate ethical guidelines, compliance, trust, transparency, privacy rights, all of these core components. We need to include that early on so that we're able to mitigate risks as early as possible. And so what are a few actionable items for AI risk management? When we look at AI risk management, it has to be completed in three dimensions, from risk management to threat modeling to vulnerability assessments, but really from three core dimensions. And those three core dimensions are administrative, technical, and behavioral. And we'll get into examples of each of these in the next slide. But within these three dimensions, as I mentioned previously with establishing robust AI governance and frameworks, we need to keep these into consideration. Limitation of the data that we're collecting or we're using, fairness, trust and transparency in the models that we're developing, we're training autonomously, privacy rights of the data that we're collecting for those users, and also data accuracy. We need to make sure that you know, we're collecting accurate data. 
And so what are some examples of this? Well, we talk about the three dimensions, administrative, technical, and behavioral. And so administratively, we have AI governance as the center, the pinnacle of developing AI policies, which are corporate laws, standards for the technology and the products and services that we're using, procedures of how to implement those standards and the technology and the services we're using, and also minimum baselines. So administratively, you can think of this as, let's say your documentation. All of this needs to be put into place. Now technical, there are a number of ways we can do technical assessments on AI products and services. Um, we can do uh, security control testing, right? We can do risk management, threat modeling, but I urge everyone to think about this holistically. And so what I've outlined here is the OSI model, right? It, it, it takes us through the seven layers. And so when you're assessing AI products and services, it's critical to understand what happens at each of these layers and also what are the potential attack vectors? Why should we know what the potential, potential attack vectors are? Because we also have to think about how will AI proliferate these attack vectors? How will it increase, right? How they're deployed, how they exploit systems. We have to take all of these in consideration. And so a very good holistic approach is to think about it from the application layer all the way down to the physical layer. Behavioral. So we have to get an understanding of how are users interacting with the Gen AI solutions that we're implementing within organizations. And so an area that I always like to discuss is prompt engineering, right? Let's say that an organization has developed an internal uh, chat bot, right? We, we wanna get an understanding of what questions are users asking it? Which data are they inputting in the chat bot? Is it sensitive data? Is it uh, PHI data? Is it PA PII data? We have to get an understanding of how are users interacting with these models? So not only can we fine tune it to make it more trustworthy, more accurate, but also to see if we're in compliance with our administrative um, requirements. Also, we have security awareness, right? AI, black box. We have to make sure that employees are aware of the potential uh, threats and the, uh, the uh, potential vectors that come with AI. And this can be done through numerous ways, security training, formal awareness programs, um, and et cetera. And then lastly, an area I really want to highlight is upskilling and development programs. So upskilling and development really outlines the ways, the programs that organizations provide to their employees to make them more technically competent, right? We want employees to understand artificial intelligence so that not only that they're able to use it, but they're able to understand fundamentally the risks that are associated with it and how to mitigate that um, for the future. And so part of my dissertation research um, combines you're looking at Gen AI and information security and how can we achieve uh, InfoSec compliance to various domains like vulnerability management, IAM, etc. And here's a figure that I developed, just a high level overview of use cases based on the NIST Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 framework. Um, so what you'll see are the different um, pillars at the top. So govern, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, and some potential use cases at the bottom. Now we're not going to get into all the potential use cases today, but part of my dissertation research looks at select uh, use cases and how can we use AI or AI powered solutions to achieve information security compliance for organizations. And so I'll take a pause right here. That concludes my presentation, but I do want to open it up for everyone. If there are any questions or 
um, additional comments and feedback. Thank you all. So any questions over here, there's a microphone on your table, if you hit that button. <coughs> Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> I know initially you had mentioned about defects and um, the ability to alter somebody's voice or maybe mimic their voice to appear as if they're saying something that they're not saying. Um, so the only thing I was going to add was that um, I think a couple of weeks ago, um, they released um, code on github on how you can essentially um, use deep fake in real time so like if let's say somebody's giving a speech you can in real time alter their speech to where as they are talk uh, giving that speech in real time they can appear to say something that they're not saying and that's a new challenge that I don't even know, um, you know, as far as fact checking, because now we can fact check because we can go back and say, you know, that's not what was said, but it being real time, um, it's just going to present different uh, challenges to trying to actually ascertain the truth. Absolutely. And that's a very interesting point you bring up. Um, we can do the same with videos as well, right? So people may deep fake voices from live conferences. I'm standing here right now, please don't deep fake my voice or my video, but that, that applies to videos as well, right? If people are attending virtual live conferences, you know, what's possible, what's next? And that's part of the black box dilemma that I previously discussed is there are so many AI vectors, cybersecurity vectors that are still unknown to the industry. And so the, 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 that scene is really, really changing dramatically every single day. The vectors are growing in the wild rapidly. And so as cyber practitioners, we have to continue to stay in tune with that and understand the attack landscape and how are malicious actors using AI to exploit systems, individuals. Yeah, that's a great point. I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, basically, I wanted to uh, ask about your views on compliance, right? So I think I find it a very interesting aspect when you want to come and regulate how the AI should operate. So in what, in your view, what are the challenges going forward? I mean, I think that you mentioned the EU AI Act. I don't know how operational it is at, at, at this point, but you mentioned that early in 2025 they will enforce. So what are the challenges here, especially given the black boxness of, of AI? What are, your, what are your views on this? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And so I'll start with the challenge of asset management for organizations. So organizations right now, they're in that innovative state of developing AI solutions, product services, you name it, right? When we have something like the EU AI Act that comes out, there's a set of criteria which constitutes what's a prohibited AI system, what's a general purpose AI system. So organizations may face the challenge of does my AI system or let's say something I'm developing in the sandbox, yeah. does it apply to that EU AI Act? Yeah. And so what they have to do is do benchmarking and internal assessments against those compliance requirements to determine if that, you know, they have to be in adherence in compliance to those. Yeah. Um, I would also say Compliance typically is a very expensive activity for organizations, right? Compliance is not a one-time activity. It's continuous. It's continuous throughout the year. So I think that is going to be another challenge for organizations where they have to strategize their budgets. They have to allocate additional funds to all of these AI cyber requirements that are going to be forthcoming. 
And so I think that will be definitely another challenge. And of course, um, lastly, is going to be talent pipeline, right? We're all in a very lucrative industry of cybersecurity and technology where um, individuals need to continue to upskill and enhance their skill sets um, from a compliance perspective. Because it, it's really divided, right? Some people focus solely on technical means, whereas others focus solely on compliance and strategy and governance. So I think, you know, as the industry continues, we're going to mesh that more in the curriculum and more of the job titles that we create so that both sides can fundamentally understand compliance. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, great question. Yeah, yeah I had one. Uh, what company would you say, this might be too broad, but from what public knowledge we have, what company or organization would you say does the best job as of now with data privacy when it's coming to training models or you know people using it? Because that's pretty hot topic of debate you see every once in a while. Yeah, that's a great question. And quite honestly, I don't have an answer to that because it's very subjective. I think it depends on what you find important in, in terms of data protection and privacy. Um, but I, I do think there are publicly available metrics or maybe, for an example, security incidents or breach quantitative metrics that you can look at. And maybe that'll be an indicator of who does a pretty good job of protecting consumer data. Do you think there is reason to be concerned about reduced effectiveness in AI based on like compliance as a whole and kind of stopping learning overall? Reduced effectiveness. Can you elaborate on that more? I would think that the idea of giving AIs a set of rules to begin with kind of inhibits learning to certain degrees. Do you think that's a concern? I, I think definitely it can constrain it. But I also do think that it, it needs a starting point, right? We, we need that human in the loop component or we need baseline configurations as part of the AI solutions we're developing. Now, you know, machine learning, um, autonomous learning, of course, you want to be as innovative as you can, right? Because you, you want the model to be autonomous and you want it to learn and to be able to make decisions effectively and efficiently. So I, I definitely see where there can be some hindering um, in that space, but I fundamentally believe that there needs to be some baseline parameters in the beginning so that models can grow and self-teach themselves. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got another one kind of following the same line. Um, do you think there will be anything or anything right now, in your opinion, that j will eventually just be straight up like as new models come out or as training, it will just be a flat like, no, you're, you can't do this. For example, like when Bitcoin was, you know, everyone was going crazy over it. There were websites where it was basically like they called Bitcoin tornadoes, where it would just mix it with everyone else's and your the traceability just disappeared. And they just blacklisted it. Like, you can't go to those websites anymore because it's great for underground organizations to just make the money trail gone. So do you think that will ever be the case for AI where there'll be some sort of feature or someone comes out with an ability and they just say, no, we are going to limit this as much as possible because this is just a little much? I believe possibly in certain areas, and it depends on the use case and the adverse impact it can have on society. So I know, for an example, a, a hot topic in industry is around misinformation, disinformation, right? And so I, I think that's an area where maybe AI can experience more regulatory oversight or more, let's say, limitation in terms of innovation, just because that has such an impact on society and people. Um, whereas if you ask me maybe around productivity, no, I think productivity is going to be a very innovative area for AI and it will continue to grow. 
So I, I definitely see some areas where it may limit it, but in others, it will make up for it from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, so I, I read recently a new term uh, called model um, collapse. And basically it's like when you feed the model on it itself, like so many times it basically just spits out no nonsense. And it kind of goes with what they're talking about. I mean, what do you see that as, it, maybe it's not exactly a threat, but you know, it's actually an impact to, you know, the use of AI, I guess. Absolutely, and so model collapse, does it relate to, let's say model hallucination? Yeah, or, is, or is, pollution and just, it's sure. full of, you know, maybe other AI generated content after so many generations, it's going to, you know, you're kind of like losing where, where, where was the truth, right? Or where's the provenance? Um, Absolutely. I, I think that's a key risk. And previously in my presentation, one of the key cyber AI risks was data poisoning, right? I would put model hallucination, I would bucket that up under there. And really model hallucination, what that deals with is in prompting when users are asking, let's say a gen AI solution, a question, it provides it a response, but it's completely inaccurate. And why does it do that? Well, if you think about from a user functionality interaction perspective, right? Organizations want users to interact with the models that they're developing, with the products that they're developing. So. Think about it like, would I rather be able to tell a consumer, I don't know the answer or give them an answer that can potentially lead them down the right path. So I definitely think that's a key risk and we'll continue to see that risk as Gen AI solutions are being developed. Okay. And, and I think model collapse, that's, an, that's interesting because what also makes me think of model collapsing is availability of the model. Right. Right. So if it's not able to be in service, users aren't able to make that. So I think that's definitely an emerging trend. That we're yeah, using. I think what I read was, you know, maybe they're training it on other models because they didn't have data available. And so they're starting to look at other ways to, you know, get the same kind of results. It's, it's when there's no, like, human intervention once being trained to distance. Right. Because once it thinks something wrong one time, it's going to think it wrong for every other time and just spirals. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you have an inaccurate data set, like you mentioned from the beginning and you're training that model on, then how skewed will your results be? Probably very skewed, depending on the inaccuracies in there. Right. Okay, we have a question um, from online from Richard. Uh, if most cybersecurity risks are currently not predictable and the most impactful ones are zero day attacks and surprises, then isn't it also impossible for AI security risks to be mitigated since AI itself is another layer of obscurity and complexity? That's an excellent question. And I want to take a minute to address the keyword impossible. If we look at that word impossible, it says I'm possible in there. So I think that is a, um, a key, a key area for us to continue to look into zero do, zero day exploits. And I do think AI is going to continue to increase zero day exploits, but I also want to emphasize defense in depth controls, right? In organizations, we have to have layered defense so that if potentially, you know, that AI v vector is able to bypass one of our controls early on, we're able to stop that and prevent it uh, during the cyber kill chain, right? And so I, I think that there is a lot of unknowns um, in that space, but we, we definitely need to continue to emphasize the defense in depth framework and methodologies. Those are great questions. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned. Okay, so uh, you mentioned addressing uh, biasness, 
with the AI models. Um, so in your opinion, do you think there is more focus of attention being paid to developing models that can detect biasness or industries are more geared up towards models that generate income? That generate income? Was right. that your so, last? Okay. Right. Basically the balance between AI for business and AI for detecting biases. Well, I think fundamentally two of those areas that you just described are critical to the success of an AI product, right? Of course, in industry, organizations want to fortify their competitive advantage in industry, right? And so the only way to really do that is to build trust, right? To have security and biases, addressing those early on within the products that you're developing is a critical success factor. I mean, if a product has significant biases or it's not operating effectively, the industry won't have an appetite for it. They won't adopt it. Um, so I think, you know, while organizations strategic plan is to be innovative and develop these products and services on the back end, part of that AI governance, uh, trust and transparency establishment that I mentioned previously, biases is a key consideration as part of that committee and also part of DevSecOps processes for AI solutions. Yeah, great question. I was expecting more questions. Mm -hmm. Any questions in the chat? Additional questions or? Anymore. Okay. I can have more questions. <laughs> it depends on your time. That's why. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm here. Me. So basically, you mentioned that you focused a lot on generative AI, right? Uh, whereas you see other areas like deep learning and so on, more on the uh, you know on the, on the other side of that circle, of that big. So is that is that the reason that we focus a lot on? Uh, of course, the whole topic now it's the generative AI. But is it uh, wh why is the 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 other areas of machine learning not part of this uh, NIST cybersecurity vision that we saw in the other slide? So fundamentally, the reason why I place emphasis on right. Gen AI is because we mm -hmm. see that the market has significant appetite for, for that, yeah, right? Yeah. Yes, so yeah. the market's telling us. We want Gen AI, Gen AI solutions. We want to implement them for internal use yeah. and for our work that we provide yeah. as service providers. Mm -hmm. And so when the industry points its focus on an right. area and they have it, a lot of times that's where technology will develop those innovative solutions rapidly. Um, that, that doesn't mean that on the ML or the deep learning side, minimal work is being done because yeah. that's not the case. A yeah. lot of organizations have created sophisticated products and services that incorporate yeah. those underlying AI components. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think you, what you're referring to is here, right? Yeah. Why yeah. isn't machine learning or deep learning a top AI cyber risk, I'll call it? Uh, uh, yeah, in the uh, no, it was in this discussion on the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, uh, basically. Oh, okay. Because those uh, those ones uh, also apply to the other areas, the cl compliance, data poisoning, and so on, also apply to the other. Absolutely. Uh, most mostly on this slide, basically, yes. Absolutely, and you know, if you look at, for an example, device and network security configurations, yeah. right? I'll, that will take significant deep learning and machine learning on Absolutely. the back end to yeah. either create those networking scanning products and services or identify vulnerabilities or whatever the case may be in terms of those technologies. So I think all of those underlying AI components are sprinkled amongst these use cases right. 
uh, from different perspectives. Yeah. Some more technical than others, mm. um, like protect and detect and respond, right? Those are going to be your more technical, um, if you want to call them cyber solutions. Yeah. It's really interesting because uh, I have to say this generative AI topic has really shaken the the world of AI because even before it's not like AI was new because uh, people were starting to work after 2013 or so but uh, with more uh, like on the neural network side deep learning and so forth but those regulations really started showing up after the generative <laughs> AI introduction. <laughs> I, I guess the reason being the power and then uh, uh, of the capability that those models bring. Yeah. It's a, a great point. Yeah. And when you ask yourself the root cause of right. all of these regulations, yeah. industry adoption, right? Exactly. But even then, uh, previous models were already adopted. It's not like they weren't using uh, AI. Primarily for yeah. internal use. Probably, probably. Yeah. Right? But now when we are incorporating AI as part of products and solution offerings mm. to yeah. clients and to customers, exactly. that changes the entire yeah. landscape. Mm. I kind of like to think about that as popularity and ease of access. I mean, when you're walking down the street, if you're with anyone that's even on a computer, you say, oh, I'm making a machine learning or deep learning model. And I have a like, oh wow, that's so cool, and a lot, or they might just stare at you blankly. Versus if I go, oh, I'm working on the chat ball and chat GPT, they're like, oh man, I've heard of that, I've yeah. used that. Yeah. 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 So I think that's it's yeah. an important, I wouldn't want to say, I don't like to say it's a buzzword because it's a, it holds a lot of importance, but that people perk up to that immediately when you say, um, you know, chat ball sure. and chat yeah. GPT, because they know what it is. Absolutely. I mean, put AI as part of a product description, what would happen at that point? So. And then the other part, you talked about the compliance. Again, I'm uh, circling it back. But the part of this compliance is about the product itself, right? Not only about the infrastructure, I suppose. But a lot of those questions, really, I'm not even sure organizations know how to answer them. Because like, you talked about procurement of models, right? So it could be that uh, whatever model you're using, you have purchased it from somebody else, right? So I I'm wondering whether now those vendors need to go through the compliance of the product itself before selling it to organizations. Because uh, if, in fact, uh, the compliance has to, is also about the, the model that you're using, a lot of those questions, you, re you really don't know how to answer them because you haven't developed it. Uh, the product right then. So this is also another uh, layer of complexity uh, as well, I think. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the organizations that have to adhere to the EU AI Act, yeah. right, in the first quarter of yeah. 2025, what they're doing now is benchmarking the requirements right. against their internal development processes right. of those AI products and services right. to say, hey, we need to be in compliance with this or else we'll face legal and financial penalties. Yeah. yeah. But what if you didn't develop it? Uh, you just procured it, it? Yes, like yeah. you outsourced it from exactly. a third party? Yes, yes, well, is... I mean, it does focus on processes as well. And right. we'll see that trend too. It's not only the underlying infrastructure of the product it's, or service itself, yeah. but also how that product or service is being used from a process standpoint. Exactly, yeah. We talked about biases, right? Biases can easily be part of the processes. The program, the, the I'm sorry, the, the machine learning, the AI product and service, that can be working effectively and efficiently, but the output of that, of what it produces, that can all be skewed by the user themselves if they have a bias, right? Mm. So it also looks at the, the process standpoint of things. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And that's the trend we'll continue to see with these regulations. Mm. It's not only focusing on the technology itself, but how we utilize that technology yeah. and the justification in which we use that technology. I see. Mm.
Yeah. Okay, so we got one great question here to close us out from Chris, who actually is our seminar speaker next week. So oh, everybody great. tune in for uh, Chris Kubeka, who's going to give us a talk. Um, so what is the one thing with AI and cyber that could keep you up at night? Oh, everything. I, th I think the easy answer is everything. Um, but no, to answer this question, what, and let me um, go back to here. An area that personally interests me and really keeps me um, up at night, um, I'll refer to it in the transport layer, right? We hear a lot about denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, but it's very interesting to see how AI is going to increase the volume and the power of DDoS attacks. I think that's something that organizations need to keep at the forefront because if their systems go down and they're not available, their service offerings will not be available. They'll have massive disruptions. Um, they'll have negative um, implications from clients. So that's an area that I think is at the forefront of my mind and it keeps me up at night. Um, of course, they're developing very innovative products and services to mitigate and prevent uh, DDoS attacks. But again, it's having that defense in depth and fundamentally asking ourselves as cyber practitioners of how can we use AI to combat these risks? How can we use AI to prevent, to detect, and to correct these risks? The list goes on and on. All right. Well, thank right. thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Really great Thank talk. you all. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.